Now our subject this evening is a, is a little um, unusual perhaps for uh, our Sunday evening addresses in, in this place uh, because it asks us to compare uh, the simple teaching of the Apostles and the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament with the development of belief amongst Christian denominations uh, throughout the period of time that has intervened and therefore it requires us to, to, to spend a bit of time actually thinking about beliefs that contrast with the teaching of the Bible which nonetheless are held out as Christian teaching. It's quite a, a, a vague subject really but I take it that we're talking about Christian teaching uh, when we're posing the question has religious teaching changed since the first century? Uh, I've actually read quite a bit on this topic and uh, in preparing for these remarks this evening, I revisited three publications that uh, are largely where I've taken the source for some of the material that I've got. I just thought I'd, I'd let you know what they were um, because whilst we've got to touch on a few things principally, what we're going to think about is what the Bible teaches about God and Christian belief about God in contrast. So I've got a book here that's quite well known entitled When Jesus Became God by the Jewish scholar Richard Rubenstein. I've got another little booklet here, The Rise of the Trinitarian Idea. Uh, which is the Michael Bonham edition of uh, an article written in the Christadelphian by uh, uh, Charlie Ladson many years ago. And I've got a, 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 an academic study here by a German scholar, um, Karl Heinz Oleg, entitled One or Three, which is, is quite difficult to read because it is uh, you know, academic in style, but also uh, was originally written in German and is a translation and it's quite... Um, quite stolted uh, as, a, as a consequence, but it's actually kind of packed with, uh, with, with detailed information. So those are the three principal sources that I've used as well as the Bible um, this evening. Now, I first of all, though, I turned to the Encyclopedia Britannica and its online application uh, to, to see what it said about the beliefs of early Christians. And it says this, amongst other things, that the early Christians thought of themselves as a redeemed community, promised eternal life in Christ, and pledged to live a holy life in expectation of the end of this world, which might come at any moment with the return of Christ as judge. And I found that pretty reassuring because that's actually quite close to as I hope most of you will recognize, Christadelphian teaching on um, at least several Bible topics. Uh, and the Christadelphian community are attempting in terms of the faith that we follow uh, to reflect the original Christian teaching as it was taught by the Lord Jesus Christ himself uh, and the apostles uh, without the intervening developments of tradition that the mainstream Christian denominations over the years have added to it. And it went on to talk about in this, this article about how that impacted upon uh, the way that they saw their place in society and in life. It said on the one hand, it seemed necessary for followers of Jesus to separate themselves from a society that was not only by Christian standards immoral, uh, but also riddled with pagan practices and yet on the other hand uh, Jesus himself had mixed with tax collectors and sinners uh, and that preaching evangelization is clearly a plain duty upon his followers and it made this interesting observation it said before Constantine this meant bringing individuals out of the world and into the church into the religious community rather than making society Christian. And that just, just highlights you know, one change and one 
set of changes that came upon the thinking and the belief system of those who identified themselves as Christian in the context of Constantine, the Roman emperor that was the first Roman emperor to support Christianity and to favor it within the Roman Empire, and indeed, as we'll see a bit later, to use it for his own political ends. So that when Christianity, as it was in 324 AD, uh, became promoted and supported by the Roman Emperor, uh, that immediately encouraged a different way of thinking uh, about the life of faith as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it orientated the church as it was in those days to think about you know, achieving what the Bible speaks about as a hope for believers by changing society through the influence of the church on society and led in time to the idea that the kingdom of God is the church, which stands in stark contrast to the very clear teaching of the Bible that was reflected in the opening statement of the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, that the early Christians were expecting the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth to judge human society and to establish the kingdom of God. So that just you know, highlights you know, one area where beliefs changed and indicates uh, the, the impetus for that change, uh, which came from the Christianizing of the Roman Empire and the different role uh, that then the Christian faith came to play in that context. Uh, principally, uh, we want to talk this evening about perhaps what is the most fundamental thing of all, which is uh, the biblical understanding of God uh, and the way in which that changed over several centuries. Uh, because surely how we understand the Almighty, uh, the creator of the heavens and the earth, as the Bible describes him, as the the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ is fundamental to any uh, faith-based system uh, that has the Bible for its reference point. And in Ephesians chapter 4, if you've still got that open in front of you, that, then the Apostle Paul here expresses things in very simple terms, doesn't he? He's talking about the united belief of the believers in the first century in which he worked, and in verse 4, he says there is one body, and there he's speaking about the community of believers. There is one community of believers who are described, amongst other figures, as the body of Christ in the pages of the New Testament. There is one body and one spirit. So he speaks about the Holy Spirit power of God, uh, which God has used to achieve various ends for establishing the opportunity of salvation. He says, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, there is one hope that believers hold on to, and that is in a first century context as reflected in the teachings of the New Testament, the hope of resurrection from the dead to live in the kingdom of God established upon the earth upon the return of Jesus. And then he says in verse 5, there is one Lord. And there he's talking about Jesus Christ. There is one Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the community of believers. One faith in which they believe rooted in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, one baptism on the basis of that faith into the believing community and one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And it's noteworthy, isn't it? That when he speaks there about God, he says there is one God, uh, the consistent belief of Old and New Testament, 
who he describes as the Father. And when he's speaking about God, he is not speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's already spoken about the Lord Jesus Christ when he said there is one Lord, uh, but he reserves almost as a climax to these set of propositions, uh, one God in verse six, one God. And when he speaks about one God, he speaks about the Father. And that's consistent throughout the Old and New Testament. Let me just take another example for you, again, from the writing of Paul. We turn back a few pages to the first letter uh, that he writes to the Corinthians and pick up there his words in the eighth chapter. And then he's talking in the context of idolatry, uh, knowing as our quotation from the Encyclopedia Britannica has already revealed uh, that many of the early Christians came from a society that was steeped in idolatry and pagan practices. And he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And he goes on then to, to talk about um, idols. And he says in verse 4, Therefore concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other god but one. So in a world that uh, believed in a multiplicity of gods, then he affirms the biblical belief in one god only. And he comments in verse 5, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there are many gods and many lords, so he's talking about paganism and the fact that society recognized and worshipped many gods, he says, even if there were so, for us, verse 6, there is one God, the Father. Yeah, so again, consistently, the New Testament, when it speaks about God and speaks about the unity of the Godhead, uh, speaks in that context of the Father, of whom are all things and we for him. And then having spoken about the one God, he goes on to speak about one Lord Jesus Christ, uh, through whom are all things and through whom we live. So the biblical teaching revolves around one God, the Father. So we'll bear that in mind and just see a few aspects of the development of thought amongst the Christian communities in the early centuries after the time of Christ and his apostles. This map kind of introduces the world of early Christianity up to about sort of 600 AD and the light kind of purplish color there it indicates you know where communities of those who profess themselves to be Christians had spread to by about 500 years or 550 years or so after the time of Christ uh, the darker purple indicates the earlier communities and of course, the gospel arose, the preaching of the New Testament with the Lord Jesus Christ in the area that we know as Israel, in the areas of Judea and Galilee and some of the immediate surrounding territories. A society that was largely a Jewish society, although under Roman rule, and the Lord Jesus Christ and the early apostles, all Jews, steeped in the Old Testament teachings of the Bible, the Jewish scriptures and the Jewish faith, who saw no discontinuity uh, between the things of the Jewish scriptures and the preaching of the gospel. Uh, they presented the preaching of the gospel as the fulfillment of those things that were indicated in the Jewish scriptures that we know as the Old Testament and no contradiction between the two and certainly no contradiction in terms of their understanding of God. 
But the area of Israel is a very small subset of that map. And the gospel soon spread out into the Roman Empire and initially the Greek-influenced world, where the gospel was being preached by firstly the Apostle Paul and his companions and by others who succeeded them after the Apostolic Age in a world that was very different to the Jewish environment in which the Lord Jesus Christ himself had preached and from which the early apostles had arisen. A world that was dominated by Greek thought. When the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great had spread out over the known world in roughly 300 BC, then they'd taken with it Greek thinking and Greek ideas, and those Greek thoughts and those Greek ideas then had heavily influenced the at least educated world in which the gospel spreads and the Greek concept of God was very different to the Hebrew biblical concept of God so there's the, the Jewish area the area of Israel circled in red uh, where the gospel began and there's in New Testament times where it spread before going further as the map indicates so it's going out into a very different context to the one in which it arose now the apostle paul spoke about some of the challenges of accepting faith in christ jesus in the first letter to the corinthians he said we preach christ crucified unto the jews a stumbling block and unto the greeks foolishness uh, the Jews were being asked to accept that their Messiah, their anointed king, anointed by God, uh, provided for their salvation, had been crucified as a criminal in a form of death that made him accursed. Uh, and for them, that was a stumbling block, an obstacle to belief. Uh, to the Greeks, with all their fancy philosophies, then belief in a crucified saviour was often foolishness. And the Apostle Paul didn't compromise on the basis of biblical faith. That was his message. We preach Christ crucified. And in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy of God, the wisdom of God, the justice of God displayed for those who would understand and respond uh, to place their faith. But when they came to talk about God in that Greek world, uh, then uh, you've got this very different attitude. So if we think about the Jews uh, and the biblical teaching about God, then, then they believed, as the Bible teaches, in a personal God, the, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the, the, the king, the lord of creation, who deliberately intervenes in the world that he has created, who gets involved in the events of history, and who is the only God so that we might think about for example the way in which the bible describes the saving of the nation of israel from their slavery in the land of egypt in the time of moses that god directly intervened for the salvation of his people that he commissioned a deliverer in the person of moses he played Egypt, bringing ten plagues upon that land in order to demonstrate his supremacy and to enforce his will upon an unwilling people. Uh, that he provided for the nation of Israel to journey for 40 years in a dry and barren wilderness uh, and yet be sustained by his miraculous intervention day by day for their sustenance. He revealed himself on Mount Sinai. He spoke of his name and his character 
to Moses and through Moses to the people. He is a God who is personal, active, and seeking a relationship with his people. Uh, the God who is without beginning and without end, therefore not limited by time, who transcends time as it restricts the life of mortal men and women, and yet nevertheless is engaged in the events of history. Uh, Greek philosophy presented a very different picture of God. So, uh, of course, you're in a world that historically was pagan and had a multitude of gods, but the philosophers had refined their thinking that had come to dominate the intellectual life of the Greek world. Uh, and they believed that God was an impersonal principle. Uh, rather than a personal God, uh, that God was impersonal and incapable of acting. That, that God was the one passive cause of everything, in everything, uh, so that ultimately everything is divine. And because their conception of God was that God was, was passive and couldn't be related to the world and, and, and the fleshly world of men and women in particular in any way, then God needed to act through other divine instruments. So they had an impersonal God who couldn't act and therefore required other individuals, other instruments through which to act. And one of their favorite ways of speaking about the instruments that God used was of the logos, the Greek word for word, the words of God, that God himself didn't do anything because he was an impersonal principle, but his word was an instrument through which he acted. Now, the idea of the Lord Jesus Christ as the word of God, God's self-expression, God's self-revelation, is found in the pages of the New Testament. Uh, so that individuals trying to defend uh, Christian teaching in the Greek world started to take the language of the New Testament and instead of presenting it within its Old Testament Jewish biblical context and started to mix it up with Greek ideas. So you had a series of individuals in the second century AD, the second half of the second century AD, who are known as the apologists uh, because they uh, wrote widely in defense of Christian teaching. And these men took a, a big step in terms of changing what Christians had believed up until that point uh, by mixing it with Greek teaching in order to make their ideas, to make their doctrines more palatable to a Greek audience. Uh, the most well-known and perhaps the most influential of them was a man known as Justin Martyr lived around about 165 AD, so over 100 years after the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, a good 100 years after the time of the teaching of his apostles, as recorded in the New Testament. He was a Greek mystic who became a follower of Christ and was a Platonist. He was heavily influenced by the ideas of Plato, the Greek philosopher. And he began one, well, he began, he, but he, he made a big step in terms of advancing this mixing of Greek and biblical thought. So he taught that Jesus is the incarnated Logos, starting to mix up the ideas of the Logos, the, the word from the Bible with Plato's ideas. And therefore, he says that in God there is a plural, because you're starting to get the idea that God himself doesn't need, do anything, he needs somebody else to do it for him, uh, and so that you end up with a plur plurality of gods. Uh, he described the Logos, as he conceived him, 
as the begotten one, but in terms of a number, as he put it, a different one than the begetter. So, so what you're finding here is that these individuals are starting to talk about Jesus Christ in Greek terms rather than biblical terms, but they're still very clear that God and Jesus Christ are distinct and different individuals. Justin Martyr says, before all creatures, God begot out of himself a reasonable force. Uh, as I say, this is Greek thinking coming through, which is called at different times the glory of the Lord, another time son, then wisdom, sometimes angel, sometimes God, sometimes Lord, and sometimes Logos. It's from a, a, a book of his that is still extant today. So he's talking about Jesus Christ, but talking about him in Greek terms and saying that he's presented through a whole range of different names. And yet he's still very clearly saying that the Logos, although he may in Greek terms be a God, is still subordinate to the first God and unlike God the creator has a beginning. He's only existed from the beginning. So, so as I say, you're, you're 100 years after the time of the apostles and you're starting to get some quite confusing language used because you're getting Greek philo philosophical language. But you're still in a situation where believers are very clear uh, that God and Jesus are different individuals. Now, we mentioned Constantine, Constantine the Great, before, and the change that happened in the Roman Empire uh, when he favoured and then adopted Christianity as the religion of empire. He, he became the sole ruler of the Roman Empire after a civil war in which he overcame his competitors in 324 AD. So uh, we're pretty much 300 years after the time of Jesus himself. And one of the reasons that he picked up on Christianity, he saw it as a means to unite the many and diverse peoples and groups within the course of the vast Roman Empire. He thought this would be a good way to bring people together by unifying his empire in this faith that he was favoring. And so he was very troubled to find uh, when he kind of set out to do this, that actually uh, the Christian denomination as it existed in his days was utterly divided. Uh, and there was a, a great argument going on uh, between different groups uh, about the position of Jesus Christ. Uh, there were those who were very clear uh, that he is subordinate to God uh, and largely Christian believers in the eastern half of the Roman Empire uh, then held that position that Jesus is great but is subordinate to God the Father. Whereas a group in Egypt and then the western half of the Roman Empire uh, held the view uh, that Jesus was so great that he was equal to God the Father. Uh, and there was quite a dramatic argument going on, so much so that you know, different Christian leaders were inciting riots between their followers and the followers of, uh, of opposing clerics in the streets of some of the cities in the Roman Empire. It's something that's quite difficult to conceive in terms of biblical Christianity as a way to behave, but, but that's the state of affairs that Constantine found. And so he convened the Council of Nicaea to resolve the problem, uh, that was in AD 325, uh, and to come uh, to kind of a standardized, unified, accepted view that could be rolled out uh, across the Roman Empire. And, and that produced uh, the famous Nicene Creed, which is still the basis of much Christian, mainstream Christian belief today. So, so this statement of faith, this creed says, we believe in one God, the Father, the almighty maker of all things, 
things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten. Well, so far, so good, very biblical. Uh, but then they have, because of this controversy about how to view Jesus Christ, some further explanation that gets quite woolly. It says that Jesus Christ is of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, and later on we also believe in the Holy Spirit with no um, additional clarification as to what they meant by that. But what they've done here is, in order to try and settle their disputes, is introduce a number of quite vague and unbiblical words to express their faith. And whilst everybody signed up to this statement of faith, bar a very small number who Constantine promptly exiled, it, it didn't solve the problem in any way. Because the people that believed that Jesus Christ was subordinate to God, then interpreted these words to mean that. Uh, and people who believed that Jesus Christ was equal to God, uh, then interpreted these words to mean that. Uh, and so the division continued and the argument continued just as vociferously as it had before. Uh, just an interesting point, which I think is relevant, uh, because at the end of their statement of faith, they said, thinking about the controversy, around how to regard Jesus Christ. Those who say there was a time when he was not, and he was not before he was made, and he was made out of nothing, or is of a different substance or essence to God, those are condemned. I just, I just highlight that because it's only 20 or 30 years later when they're saying something completely different. Um, that, 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 that they're making it very clear that however you understand these words, you're, you're saying that you can't say that Jesus Christ was a different substance or essence to the Father. As I say, over time, the argument continued. It wasn't resolved in any way, and it increased in complexity by about 370 AD because it was added to by some considerable controversy as to how to regard the Holy Spirit. And a group of individuals known as the Cappadocians made a considerable impact on the thinking of the church called Christian in the Roman Empire at, at that time. This was a group of individuals from Cappadocia, um, centered around a man, Basil, the Bishop of Caesarea, known as Basil the Great in uh, religious circles, and his brother Gregory, and, a, and another Gregory, who was a friend of theirs, who, who uh, tried to wrestle with these problems that were dividing uh, the uh, belief of Christians at that time. And what Basil said was, look, teachers use essence and being or substance interchangeably. Right? So, so the Nicene Creed that they'd rolled out in the time of Constantine from 325 AD said, look, you're condemned if you suggest that Jesus is a different essence or a different substance to God, whatever that means. Now, now these guys said, no, that can't be right. right. That's a mistake. That essence and being or substance are actually different things. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three different beings, three different substances, each with individual characteristics but they are one and the same in essence. So again, you're talking about very vague and confusing words, but now you're contradicting something that's been rolled out in your statement of faith 50 years previously. So that what this 
Cappadocian teaching, as it came to be accepted, did, was to make it clear that if Christ was fully divine, if he had the essence of God, then God could not primarily be a father, but must, just as much as he's a father, be a son and be a spirit. So in the 370s, and then in the church council of 380 AD or 381 AD in Constantinople, and then when this kind of Cappadocian teaching was rubber stamped, you had ultimately through this evolution that had begun in the second century and gone through the, the third and into the fourth century, a complete break with the teaching of Jesus and the early apostles. So that, as Rubenstein points out in, in his book, that up until this point, then Jews and Christians could agree. They believed in one God, the Father, but they might then have a dispute about whether Jesus Christ was the Messiah and what his relationship was to God. Even though the world had many gods through its pagan traditions, then most paganism was by 300 AD settling down to what is called enlightened paganism, so that the belief in a multiplicity of different gods with different names had been abandoned and Pagans generally believed in one supreme God, often identified with the sun. So that when you were having a discussion between Christians and pagans, well, the question was, okay, we both believe in one supreme God. It's a question of whether or not the God of the Bible, the God of Christianity, is that God or not, or whether or not Christian teaching is an accurate reflection of that God. So you had quite a common starting point that everybody you know, could believe in, in one God, the Father, but there was a question as to how you regarded Jesus Christ. What this teaching did was to sever that connection completely because now you had a God in three parts. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all equally gods. And in Constantinople in 381 AD, they said, we believe in one God, the Father, pretty much the same as they had in 325, but they also now introduced belief in the Holy Spirit as also being part of the Godhead. So by the time we get to that stage, we're over well over 300 years after the time of Jesus Christ. So this is what Rubenstein says. Doctrinally, this is the point around in the 370s, crystallized in 381 in the Council of Constantinople. Doctrinally, this is the point at which Christianity breaks decisively with its parent faith, Judaism, and other forms of monotheism, belief in one God. For Nicene Christians, incorporating Jesus into the Godhead was a way to preserve and extend the worship of Christ without sacrificing their belief in one God. For others, by defining Jesus as God incarnate, by definition, throughout monotheism, throughout the idea that there's one God. It was not just a question of Jesus being recognized as God, but of God becoming Jesus, that the one God became and included Jesus through this teaching for the first time. So that by the time you get to 380 AD, you've got a completely unbiblical situation 
you've got a situation where the teaching of the New Testament and the teaching of the Old Testament uh, as the basis for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching of his apostles uh, has been completely abandoned for this new conception of God. Uh, a conception which is you know, the central belief of most who call themselves Christians today. Macaulay, famous 19th century historian, makes this comment uh, within the Roman context. He says, by the time you get to the 5th century AD, Christianity had conquered paganism. Christianity had taken over the Roman Empire. It had become its leading and dominant religion. But paganism had infected Christianity. The church was now victorious and corrupt. The rites of the Pantheon had passed into her worship and the subtleties of the academy into her creed. So the observation of the historian was that in this process over 400 years, uh, then paganism had infected and corrupted a Christian teaching, making it unrecognizable from the teaching of Jesus Christ and his apostles. So that this guy, Oli, in his very detailed and careful academic study, he says, it is certain, and there seems to be no getting around this assumption, that Jesus himself knew only of the God of Israel, whom he called Father, and he knew nothing about his later deification, his later being regarded as a God. By what right, therefore, can a doctrine of the Trinity be regarded as the kind of key central teaching of the Christian church when it clearly wasn't, he says, categorically it wasn't, the teaching and understanding of Jesus Christ? How, in other words, can one legitimize doctrinal development that actually first began in the second century AD, in the third century AD found a turn to a completely new triadic, a message about three persons, and was in the fourth century put in formulas and in turn brought about, particularly in the Latin West, a variation that was utterly different to what had been believed previously. It is certain, he says, that the doctrine of the Trinity, as it in the end became dogma, both in the East and even more so in the West, possesses no biblical foundation whatsoever. And so has religious teaching changed since the first century? was the topic I was asked to speak about this evening, then absolutely yes it has. And that the mainstream understanding of God and of the relationship between the Father and Jesus Christ, his Son, that is held by most Christian denominations and spoken of in terms of the Trinity, was categorically not the understanding of Jesus Christ himself and the early apostles. It is not the teaching of God's word, the Bible. God's word, the Bible, teaches one God, the Father, Jesus Christ, his son, a man, a special man, the greatest of men, but a man nonetheless. Uh, and the question you know, that arises and that Oleg really comes to in his uh, analysis of the way in which things changed over the centuries is, is how can you have a religion that, that's called after an individual, Jesus Christ, that, that owns the Lord Jesus Christ as its head, and yet teaches something utterly different than he did. Teaches something utterly different about 
himself than he did. It's an absurdity. It's an absurdity. So, you know, we appeal. We appeal for a return to the Bible. To actually look at the, the simple teaching of Christ and his apostles. To see the logic and the cogency of what they present. And to place faith in a biblical belief system and not one that owns the majority of its thinking to the philosophies of men.